Uh, dear audience, uh, so nice to have you online in such great numbers as today. It's my privilege to have the chance to discuss with you guys once again how the cybersecurity regulations are being updated. And uh, today uh, our agenda will consist of uh, the latest additions to e mainly EU regulations. Let's check what's happening in USA and then look what's happening in the market and then uh, about uh, your questions. But uh, for first, a quick introduction to Eteplan. So we're an engineering company focusing on software and embedded solutions, about 4,000 people, 300 million revenues. And we serve a very wide range of equipment manufacturers and process industries, and also a bit of consumer brands and different services. We're located around the Baltic Sea. Main the software competences are in Poland, Sweden, and Finland, and in, then in Netherlands and Germany, we also have a technical documentation and, uh, and engineering capabilities. We work in China, several offices also serving uh, European companies locally. And uh, a little bit also about our background in cybersecurity. So uh, we've been providing customers with pen testing services since 2018, a small scale. And then we started uh, employing secure development lifecycle and different device and software development projects in the big, around the beginning of last year. Before that, of course, our big team of around 700 software embedded developers have been implementing different kind of security functionalities, many different industries and projects. So that's sort of our background in this topic. And if there's anything where we can help, please <laughs> stay in touch. So agenda for today. So today I'm going to talk from an equipment and software engineering company's perspective about updates to cybersecurity and safety legislation. That's very important. Then let's take a look once again at the general terms and conditions of, of purchasing for groups and services. We're going to look at some industry examples. I have a couple of conclusions, predictions. And meanwhile, if you have any specific questions, please write them to the chat and we can take them in the end of the presentation. Uh, there's going to be a lot of legislation in the beginning. So my main sources are the European Parliament's legal observatory. So if you want to find anything more about any regulations, it's good to put in the Google search than the legal observatory. So you'll get access to all the documents that are, are available for draft legislations. So uh, now it looks like by end of 2024, cyber security of companies and of all their, their offerings is quite a horizontal legal requirement. And this is due to safety, privacy and fundamental rights risks that are caused by new digital technologies such as connectivity, artificial intelligence, autonomous robotics that were not addressed about 10 or 20 years ago yet. But now EU is updating legislation to address uh, these new technologies and making also the provisions to address whatever new technologies come our way so the legislation can anticipate those also. Then uh, what you need to understand that if you make a certain type of a uh, software or a device or a product or digital service, there's probably many different legislations that uh, impact uh, or regulate the cyber security of you as a company and the digital service or device that you, that you are putting on the market. Uh, there's in the EU a uh, general term that this, there can be generic legislations and there's more specific rules per industry. And of course, always more specific and more detailed and more encompassing rules go than define in more detail something that is regulated in other legislation. Today, I will discuss or touch all of these legislations that are visible. Uh, on the topic, I see different vertical cybersecurity legislation. So, medical and industrial diagnostic devices, I will touch those briefly. Automotive uh, cybersecurity legislation. Then, uh, of course, of big interest, perhaps for many, is this radio equipment directive delegated acts that uh, become effective in EU in August 24 for wireless IoT devices. And then, this draft uh, proposal for machinery regulation. These are vertical ones. Then from the horizontal side, there's maybe the most important one is the Network and Information System Directive uh, 2 proposal, like the updating of the NIS directive that became effective in, uh, that was uh, applied, become app applicable, came into force in 2016 and started applying in 2018. So I will first talk about that. 
Then there are a couple of other horizontal safety legislations for all general, the general product safety directives being updated, it's turning into a regulatory purple regulation, and then artificial intelligence acts. And these two are safety legislations, which contain a couple, some cybersecurity requirements. And the important thing is for you guys to understand that what's the intended use and which all uh, cybersecurity legislations that are currently existing and are going to be soon enough uh, turn become applicable and effective are going to affect your company and the products that you have. The first one that we're going to talk about is uh, NIS2. So what you need to understand is that uh, the scope of essential and important entities is significantly widened. There are essential entities that uh, member states authorities should monitor uh, Ex ante, that means proactively that they implement these uh, cyber all the requirements of NIS2, and then there's the important entities which uh, national authorities should uh, monitor and supervise when there has been a cyber security incident. And what is, of course, for this audience is of big interest is that we have manufacturing is in the important entities. Basically, all manufacturers of electrical equipment and electronical equipment will turn into important entities. And that, uh, that means that they also need to implement the same kind of information security uh, uh, measures than these essential entities. There can be some slight uh, differences in, in the application. And then I bolded a couple of ones that came in very late. So maybe couple of very interesting one, of, uh, of course, a no-brainer is that they are the managed uh, security services providers to the list of essential entities that need to have a regulatory uh, baseline for their information security management. But they also are the managed service providers that if you maintain for a third party or for your customer software, application, cloud solutions and such, you turn into a managed service provider and you're an essential entity. So this is sort of uh, what you can expect and also good to understand here is that the, the chemicals production and distributions of all these uh, companies that process chemicals like metals and plastics and you name it so they are also important entities and they in the later phases they also added this article manufacturing where the properties of the physical shape of the component of this you know this part is more important than its chemical properties that's article manufacturing so even like turning, making a mechanical part from chemicals is probably turning into an important entity. So this is quite wide and quite big. And uh, it's, I really recommend that you take a look at this provisional agreement and take a look at how this impacts, impacts your company. So uh, on October 22nd, the EU parliament will vote on this too and start the voting and uh, there will probably be no more changes to this and uh, it will most likely be uh, approved and it will i would expect that it's in the official journal in early 23 so then it enters into force and then member states have 21 months time to adapt uh, these two requ requirements into their own member member state legislation so this means that uh, the information security management of all of these companies, including the development of software and devices uh, from certain aspects is, is regulated in late 24. And, and this is a, you know, a really big thing. This actually puts EU as the most uh, regulated, so let's say your companies that uh, work in or operate in Europe uh, are gonna be the most uh, regulated companies in the world from a cybersecurity perspective. And this is just kind of the information security perspective. Let's look at a couple of definitions. So what is a network and information system definition? So uh, this is in the, in the NIS. So I would like to emphasize, of course, electronic communications networks, and of course, the data, but any device or a group of devices that are interconnected of which one or more person to a program perform automatic processing of digital data. So this practically means that, that all, all of these uh, devices and uh, software that these essential and important entities use in their operations or in the provisioning of their services are sort of underneath to regulation. And uh, here I would already want to tell you that these requirements will roll down the supply chain 
And the most important, if you want to start a family rising with NIST 2, uh, please start with Article 18. And of course, the Annex 1 and 2. Annex 1 and 2 are the list of essential and important entities. But here in Article 18, we go into what are the information cybersecurity risk management measures. So what I can interpret it as an information security management system, including secure product development lifecycle, becomes mandatory for entities and also their tier one suppliers, because these entities need to require it. So what's in Article 18? It's basically on this first column, it's it's if you read it through and look through the table of contents of an information security management system standard like ISO 27000, well, you see that there's similar kind of kind of requirements that are needed. But then the important interesting things are kind of related to secure software and product development lifecycle is that, of course, uh, supply and security related to direct suppliers is mandatory. Then this uh, section 18. 2E is quite self-explanatory. Security of network and information systems acquisition, development and maintenance, including vulnerability handling and disclosure. This means the whole secure product development and software development lifecycle of any network and information systems. And then these entities need to make sure that their direct suppliers, for example, software companies that make digital services for these essential entities or important entities need to have appropriate secure development procedures. And what this legislation really asks is that there's kind of appropriate uh, uh, appropriate levels of, of measures in place in the organization, that it's a risk-based approach and uh, something that's appropriate for the considering the risks and such. So, so this is quite big. And then here on the right side, there will probably be a delegated act uh, putting in mandatory requirements for for uh, certain entities. And these managed service providers are in this uh, list of entities in Article 24.1b and so on. So, so this will be a very horizontal cybersecurity legislation in EU uh, that will basically impact all industries maybe regard, with exceptions of, let's say, consumer brands, maybe if they don't manufacture themselves like uh, computer games, uh, sports gear, as such, where there's no software, no software in the products involved. But well, let's say consumer businesses maybe, maybe are a little bit less here in the essential entities present. Maybe we have like postal and career service and waste management and such, but otherwise, otherwise, you know, it's security, cybersecurity becomes quite horizontally regulated in the end of 24 via this needs to. And I hope you can interpret that this sort of affects that these kind of essential entities like operators of critical infrastructure, like uh, let's say power plants as such, need to require from the equipment suppliers the information security management system, security development life and these equipment manufacturers in turn need to require from their suppliers like the tier ones, tier twos and such. So, so I'm going to later show what's happening, like you know, talk about what's ha what has happened in automotive where cybersecurity management is mandatory and such. So there's going to be a couple of examples how we how this will play out. So, but this is not all. Then uh, European safety legislation is is renewed. And this means that uh, the CE declarations of conformity for product and software need to be renewed. The existing ones will expire, so to say. And uh, uh, of course, automotive is missing from this list. Uh, I'm going to mention that in all new type, type approvals uh, starting July 24, cybersecurity management is mandatory. And in all new manufactured cars in, after July 24, it's mandatory. So that's something. But but uh, then after automotive, the second big industry where this kind of, let's say the permission to sell products and software aims is medical device and in vitro diagnostic devices. And there, you know, the regulations came in 2017, the transition period, you could play around so that you could keep the old products, uh, non-compliant products on the market since uh, up to like 25. But there was um, from zero to four years time to, optimize the time of the market and and then uh, one important thing is the harmonized European standards to prove compliance conformance with these essential requirements related to security so these are something that are needed in order not to need to 
necessarily use a notified body in the type inspection. Of course, the medical devices there are, but the Europe is planning to harmonize IEC 810051, uh, that's the same as IEC 6244341 for secure product development lifecycle, and then the IEC 6060145, that's the same, pretty much the same as IEC 6. Four two three uh, four two. So it's sort of based on those, and FDA has also kind of acknowledged those standards. So that's happening in medical. Now the big thing is most radio equipment. I want to emphasize this. So uh, the Red Delegated Acts uh, came into uh, entered into force on the 12th of January this year, and they will start applying starting 1st of August. This means that. Practically for all wireless IoT devices, except for medical IVD, automotive, airplane, and road tolling, the declarations of conformity need to be renewed in order to keep these wireless IoT devices on the market. And uh, the harmonized standards development has been late. So now, finally, in June, this uh, standardization request was sent to sent to uh, Senelec, and uh, they had already been investigating what this could be. So hopefully next summer we have some drafts and uh, those could help in, help in designing new products. Uh, then other uh, legislation, Artificial Intelligence Act, that's also proceeding. There's amendments going on. Maybe it will be in the official journal in early 23. There's a transition time of two years. They have asked for harmonious standards development. Then the machinery and software and ensuring safety functions that could also be the official journal after the end of the, this year. They have a four-year transition period proposed, and then, then an extra year after after that. So it will be like five years, up to like 28 that you could have time, 27 or 28 that you can empty your stocks of, of, of non-compliant machinery. Then what you need to also understand, there's a general product safety regulation. Uh, probably being also now amended and probably approved also in the same time with the AI Act, the NIS2 and machinery regulation. And that only has a one year uh, transition period before it starts applying. And, and this has one fundamental cybersecurity requirement. Now, if you think about that, there's no harmonized technical standards in what, well, how, what kind of secure product development lifecycle to follow, what technical functionalities to implement in order to mitigate cybersecurity risks. A secure product development lifecycle is one way to, to kind of create this uh, documentation that uh, you can prove to a notified body and uh, authorities that you have taken these essential requirements related to cybersecurity into consideration. And uh, now the biggest question, of course, now is related to Red Delegated Act, making new IoT products connected, wirelessly connected devices. My tech now is more than one year. And, what to do well, if you want to ensure that you're now developing a wireless product and you want to make sure that you can keep on selling it, that you don't need to start next, next summer with a new so software and hardware design round. So now you need to call and contact a red, delegate, a red notified body and ask how they are able to in inspect or make the type ex examination for radio devices. But pretty much here you can see on the list these different cybersecurity requirements that are in these different regulations. Uh, maybe this uh, uh, Red Delegated Act 3.3D is the common one for most wireless devices. And, uh, and we discussed this with our software chiefs and we consider the most important thing is to make sure that nobody can, to prevent that these devices can be uh, uh, utilized by malicious third parties to degradate, degradate network steps to keep the soft, the firmware intact to make sure that it stays, uh, it, it is not tampered with or, or changed and so on. And this, of course, requires certain hardware selection and, and the implementation of a wide range of security functionalities and supporting security infrastructure for provisioning to, to, to field updates and, and so on. Um, a couple of highlights, uh, Artificial Intelligence Act. It's uh, good to notice that here they are also already stating that the quality management system is needed for developing high-risk artificial intelligence. That is, uh, if there's any safety function in the AI application, and this happens to be a product group that is already under type examina examination, 
under European harmonization legislation. There's a list of two pages, about 50 product groups that are currently kind of under, um, under this harmonization legislation. Then perhaps uh, good for everybody to consider, remember this general product safety regulation. It will impact all of physical products and also indirectly all the software that is installed on physical products. So, so you cannot take too lightly this uh, kind of need of cybersecurity. And then you might think about uh, how is it not possible that uh, I, I need to stop selling in EU these all these IoT devices that I have. And uh, it's it's the fact is so that that uh, a product when you place it on the market, of course, uh, place a product into the market, you, it needs to comply with essential requirements in red. And uh, now, if you want to meet these new security requirements, but there's no HEM standards, then you need to have a notified body conduct in the type examination. So that's for the new product. But then uh, then sort of looking at these uh, legacy products on the market. So it's actually shown that the member states shall make sure that no that, that the sales of non-compliant IoT devices ends. So you cannot make it's illegal to make available on the market. And they shall also make prevent that uh, new non-compliant IoT devices, wireless IoT devices are put into service. So this is sort of the couple of sections in the red directive and the blue guide uh, that explain why it will, this will be illeg illegal to sell these non-compliant, uh, non-conforming wireless IoT devices in Europe. That's pretty much it. In the US they have this executive order 14.028 Yesterday I checked what's going on. So the only thing that they are 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 have been actually uh, related to mandatory legislation. They are updating federal acquisition regulation for unclassified information system. Otherwise, my interpretation is that NIST has so far only produced guidance. So so Europe is sort of leading a little bit in this. Then about the industry example. So earlier I discussed, in earlier webinars I've been presenting, I've been, I've been going, going through maybe 100 different GTCs of, of uh, different industrial companies. And, and what could be seen that since 2021, most of, many of them have been adding information security management requirements to the general terms and conditions of purchasing. So, so basically if you don't have this, you're in breach. If there's a cybersecurity in incident, they can say that, You've been in breach of contracts. Uh, related to secure product development cycle and making, making safety legislations, of course, all the companies require that all applicable safety and other legislations are followed. And then the companies have uh, lately also started adding requirement, explicit requirements affecting chipsets and software and firmware. Also, that secure development life cycle needs to be followed, especially in industrial automation, which is also a big player in in building automation, then those companies have really been, been in the forefront of this cyber security. I will maybe want to bring up one topic, a good example, Schneider Electric updated their general terms and conditions in 22. And I checked this in the beginning of the week and I could see that they, they have sort of very well aligned with uh, these two, these, uh, these uh, certain clauses. So a supplier needs to maintain an uh, information security management system that is aligned with applicable industry standards like 27001. And if there's any software firmware chipsets, the development and also production of these needs to be aligned with uh, 27001 and 62443. But the big thing is that all of these development environments, infrastructure and such, all the all the systems uh, that are used, so they need to be developed according to several secure development lifecycle practices. So they are rolling down actually these uh, these requirements uh, also to their to their suppliers and their supplier suppliers and all the IT. So this is a good example of how in industrial automation and electricity distribution are such that these requirements are being updated. Uh, automotive. So what happened like uh, about one year ago? that uh, in automotive industry the cyber security management uh, system requirements started rolling down the supply chain down to tier one tier two and tier three and it took about half a year that we could start seeing that the general terms and conditions for purchasing have been updated that information security management are mandatory and this cyber security management system actually contains both the information security management and secure product development life cycle in automotive and 
in medical devices, uh, the, pretty much the same thing is happening. We realized also that the secure development lifecycle needs to be in the quality management system. And, and this is one of those industries where, where cybersecurity is a regulatory requirement from the type examinations. And also then these big uh, healthcare players have much stronger requirements also. Looking here at the Kaiser Permanent, a big hospital chains, of course, all FDA, FDA is the authority in the US where, which makes these uh, market approvals, checks these, but then you need to have much more. You need to fulfill their own requirements, like software bill of material traceability, no IoT business models, and secure development life cycle for this kind of devices also. So uh, the regulatory requirements are strict, but the customer requirements for leading global companies are much stricter. So that's also something to prepare for. So conclusions and predictions. Uh, based on what I have seen, read and discussed in the industry, so minimum capabilities in security for staying competitive in industrial products, software and services could be that you need to somehow have a in certified information security management system, especially in the automotive industry such that requires this. And then you need to have a formal secure product or software development lifecycle, either in your quality management system or in your information security management system. That's something that you're going to need. And then a couple of future predictions based on what I've seen here. So uh, neglecting the cybersecurity related market change, that's a strategic mis mistake because the market is now changing. We saw what happened in, in automotive and we can, based on that, understand what happens when this becomes effective. The radio equipment directive delegated acts in this 23 months of time to, to kind of update your devices to be, have this fundamental cybersecurity functionalities. But it was linked to the fact that without cybersecurity capabilities, which are formal, the companies can place new products and uh, software digital services on the market or put them into use of customers. In the similar way, it will be very difficult to sell products to these uh, essential and important entities because they will enforce security purchase requirements. And then the important thing is also, you know, if you break the law, uh, liability insurance probably will not compensate. And when this cybersecurity becomes a legal requirement in product safety legislation and is to, and you have a cybersecurity incident and you haven't complied to the legislation, uh, there's a big risk that you need to, from your own pocket, uh, dig out the, to kind of recovery costs related to cybersecurity incidents. This is a huge financial risk, actually. So, uh, what else will happen? So, IoT device, database business models could experience reduced profitability. Of course, it's the much tighter security requirements for customers and regulators. But on the other hand, there's an upside is that the there's a reduced, hopefully reduced risk of cybersecurity incidents by having the fundamentals in place, both software development environments, physical security, HR security and such. And, and then the other big thing which I haven't talked about is the EU Data Act, which is planning that all the data that's collected from devices that, uh, that turns into the property of the customer that has created the data, that should be freely made available. So. Uh, database business models or initial logics might change also. And then the third one is that uh, I have the gut feeling the quality management system and information security management system become sort of must-haves in order to create documentation as evidence of conformance with the applicable safety and security legislations and, and to prove that you have met the contractual terms with customers and especially in case of cybersecurity incidents that of course when placing products on the market. So. So that's pretty much what I had in, in mind. Uh, uh, Oscar, do, did we have any questions here? Yes, we do. Three questions. Yes. First question, regarding the upcoming Data Act and probable requirement for sharing acquired data with the owner of, of the equipment, do you see it having some impact on cybersecurity? That's a very good question, something to look look into i would imagine imagine that uh, that uh, it will have a, have an effect and maybe that is some something i'm, I'm just wondering how they will realize this in integration and, and this data data transfer mechanism i need to take a look at the, that data in, in more detail it has had to do something how this data sharing is actually 
taking place? Very good question. Thank you. Well, okay, question next. number two. Radio equipment supports certain features ensuring protection from fraud. What might yeah. this mean in practice? Yes, so if there's any monetary transactions uh, being made with this uh, wireless IoT device, it's been made, uh, you know, payment, some kind of payment transaction. So it needs to contain the appropriate security features. And you know, all these mobile devices today, they have hardware based security and, and uh, what a three domain security for for authenticating yourself. So it's it's practically to you need to utilize this risk based approach for for figuring out what functionalities you need to prevent in order to prevent fraud. And unfortunately, we don't yet have the harmonized standard available for that. But but if you have some industrial device which which has a subscription or your invoicing based on use and such that that is something that needs to be take into consider maybe looking what's about how it's done when there's monetary transactions in, in mobile devices and what are the main functionalities and assets used in that. That would be my recommendation where to start. Very okay, good question. question. Tricky question. Good. Question number three. Is there a definition for a wireless IoT device? Does it mean any device using a wireless con uh, network? Yes, any radio. Any that's in the red, red. So what if it's the, if it contains some kind of a radio that transmits? And now I don't remember if a GPS, which received receiver also uh, only receivers are considered radio equipment. Uh, that that I don't remember probably not, but I, that I can comment. But anything with a wireless radio interface slash radio interface that is wireless IoT. Okay, last question for now. Uh, do you think the test labs will have capacity to handle the forthcoming rush? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, in EU they are preparing sort of if you want to be on the safe side relative to this uh, red delegated act. So uh, in the Etsy CA, well, uh, no, red CA, this we have where Etapan is participating. There's a mailing list where these have been discussed. So. So some of the red notified bodies are prepared to assess products, I guess, the Etsy consumer standard 30365. And this also has, has a sort of a testing standard, if I remember, because 103645. And there's many test cases. Then in EU, they are also preparing a PRN17640, a fixed time, secure, let's say, security testing standard. That would enable it has a certain scope, a certain lead time, and uh, that that is used for testing or verifying the security functionality as part of this these different security regulations. So, so th there are test testing standards, especially this fixed time, which the the Germans are are heavily driving. But uh, suppose they are, of course, this documentation verification. Maybe the things with the EU is thinking that how can we test objectively these radio devices? Of course, subjectively, what notified bodies do, that's possible. So you inspect and based on how notified bodies do, they conclude that this is, is this OK or not. But, but the problem is how to do security testing very objectively. What are the test cases and such? And that is something that they have been discussing. And it feels like a bit what, I, what I've been hearing, that it's going back a bit towards this kind of mix of objective and subjective testing. And, and uh, if you want to, you know, follow up on this, I recom recommend participating in this Etsy's Etsy uh, conferences and other cyber, big cybersecurity conferences that are taking place in EU because all these big companies have the compliance specialists also in place at the test lab and such. But the, now initially with Red, there might be a heavy burden on the notified bodies. One option is, of course, that the EU gives more time transitional period for red, but don't count on it. Other okay, questions? one more question. When are the standards for IoT devices cybersecurity verification expected to be in place? Yes, so let's take a look at this. Here we go. So basically you're mostly talking about this radio equipment. So development has now been requested. And uh, I remember that it takes about 18 months to get them to the phase where EU 
approve them or not. I hope that next summer we have drafts available uh, for these, and then it's going to go sort of probably to early 24 before the, the official journal. So this is quite a, let's say, business risk not right now, that you might get the official approved standards available on like six months, seven months before the Red Delegated Act uh, starts applying. And that's why it's maybe important if you want to play it on the safe side, contact the notified body to, to sort of get your declaration of conformity in place, compliant already with the delegated act in beforehand. And uh, this is, I know, because uh, uh, putting radio devices on the market don't necessarily yet require any quality management systems or formal process. So I think this is this is sort of a, maybe a big problem for the smaller companies, especially. How you do you create the evidence? And, and you have been able to put radio devices on the market without notified body involvement. So that's a that's a issue issue right now. Okay, any other questions? One question has come. Uh, could we have those product security test standard names in writing? Well, I think we can distribute this. Yeah, this will go, this, uh, this will, yeah, okay, yes. Uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, yes, so let's put them here. So probably it's, uh, uh, it's uh, this is one. Then if I remember co correctly, this is the, the kind of the tech standard. Now, don't shoot me if I remember, remember but Google this. Uh, test standard. This is the consumer IoT. And then I remember there's something called TRN 17644 and fixed time security testing or something like this. So now this comes into this webinar uh, webinar tracking, but these numbers might go in the wrong way, but I'm going to check these and, uh, and uh, I'm going to post those on, on LinkedIn, which were the correct. But Probably these three are these two I talked about. These two numbers can be in the wrong way, wrong order, and you might find a welding standard with the, <laughs> with the same name. So I don't know what those guys are thinking in those standardization organizations. I hope this was helpful. And then, of course, if you go with IEC 62443 for for uh, if you go with IEC 62443. Uh, for one, that's the SPD, uh, SPDL, and and the four two, which is technical requirements. So this is in, let's say, in industrial equipment, medical equipment, considered as the as the state of the art standard. So you should also be on the safe side with this. But check, talk with our notified body also. And then there's of course. For these tests coming out for 62443 are testing sort of a auditing standard coming also to 62 is coming at some point. Good. Any other questions? No, that's all for now. Okay. Hey, not to guys to scare you when you have got the cyber security in, in place. Uh, just a heads up. <laughs> the next regulatory challenge for physical products seems to be this eco design regulation. So you've heard about the sustainability and reducing carbon footprints and environmental friendliness. So, so and you also know that there's been an eco design directive since 2009 about 20 device categories that consume energy like inventors and electrical motors. So they are now expanding this to all kinds of physical products and there's going to be a series of delegated acts in the second half of 25. And let's see what product groups those will encompass. But there's interesting, you know, software related requirements that are also going to be there about software updates, not worsening product performance and so on. But a heads up and if you're interested, maybe there's going to be a webinar about this at, at some point. Because 24, you need to get your cybersecurity in shape and then starts to come a little bit more of eco design and so on into these embedded devices. So a little bit of quick quick glimpse forward so thank you so much for your time and for for joining in and i wish you a good autumn and if you have any questions don't hesitate to reach out to me by email or phone 
and uh, we can discuss these topics in more detail also over teams if you want okay thank you everybody have a good day